Hello, everyone. I'm going to wait one more minute for um, people to join. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Eric Rehm. I'm a senior oceanographer with Seabird Scientific, and my area of specialty is ocean optics. And we're going to talk about uh, fluorometry today, in particular chlorophyll fluorometry. And I'm going to start from first principles as to you know what, why it is that we measure chlorophyll in the ocean why we uh, choose fluorometry and how our fluorometers work, and then some innovations that we're working on to hopefully make a better estimate of uh, chlorophyll, which is um, essentially one of the things that we're after as a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. So that's actually a quick tour of, a, of the whole presentation there. Um, um, I want to encourage you to use the chat to um, log any questions that you have as we go through. Um, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to um, answer those questions at the end. Um, I've tried to make this presentation fit a lot of audiences. So if you're an ocean biologist and, um, or if you're an ocean optics person, there's something for everyone. Uh, don't be concerned if you don't capture everything here, um, but um, we'll proceed. So uh, again, we're going to be talking about chlorophyll fluorescence and um, why it is that we are making some innovations with our fluorometer. So carbon is the currency of climate change. That's a mouthful. But this is a, one of the traditional pictures of the ocean as its part in the uh, Earth's carbon cycle. And as we know, the ocean is uh, both a carbon sink, it stores carbon, and it also is, um, a, it, it is a sink for CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's also a uh, source for CO2 in the atmosphere, depending on the region of the ocean and the kind of activity that is going on. And as you know, uh, from human caused sources, we're increasing the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere and the ocean is uh, doing its job, which is um, uh, working inord uh, inordinately hard to store some of that carbon. As we know, there's really two kinds of organisms in, in the world. There are essentially autotrophic organisms um, that uh, uh, essentially um, consume carbon dioxide and create carbon through either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, but largely photosynthesis. And then there are organisms like ourselves that produce uh, CO2, we respire, we inhale or uh, use oxygen and then um, 
uh, create carbon dioxide. We're going to focus here on phytoplankton pho photosynthesis, which is um, the, the primary source or primary production in the ocean of carbon. Some portion of that carbon, as shown, uh, can, is, is uh, put into long-term storage in the deep ocean. Some of it is respired and goes back to the uh, atmosphere. It's important to note that the ocean holds 50 times more CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is a temperature and uh, condition dependent um, number. So if we're talking about phytoplankton photosynthesis and we're talking about carbon, we want really to understand that carbon, as I said, as a currency, you know, what is that? So why do we measure chlorophyll? Chlorophyll A is a proxy for phytoplankton carbon biomass. And on the right, what we see is a graph in the horizontal dimension is chlorophyll A in the ocean on a logarithmic scale. And on the vertical scale is the actual carbon. And these are done with different measurements. Chlorophyll A was done either fluorometrically or with a high performance liquid chromatography. But just assume we can measure chlorophyll A of a water sample accurately in some manner. And then with carbon, there are various techniques to actually measure the carbon content in a sample of water. You could imagine, you know, essentially evaporating all the water and then combusting this and using a very sensitive mass spectrometer or similar instrument. The point is you can see a lot of spread. There's almost two orders of magnitude of spread, but this uh, relates to sort of the famous carbon to chlorophyll ratio, which is both species dependent and physiologically dependent. So you could say it's hopeless, but it's not really. We can see definitely there is a trend that there's more chlorophyll indicates there's more carbon. In fact, some people, and this is just one empirical relationship of many that have been developed in the literature, that there is essentially a power relationship between chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A to the beta power times A. And we can see that those param even in those parameters, there are quite a few in that table there, depending on where you are, whether you're offshore, Tokyo Bay, estuary stations, open water stations, this is just a small portion of the data and studies that have been um, available. Those different relationships are shown in that graph in the right with the different um, shaded bars. The point is we can make a relationship between chlorophyll and carbon, however imperfect, to satisfy our, our desire to under or create a, you know, uh, essentially a currency in carbon units out of chlorophyll, and that's really important. So if we measure chlorophyll, we can make an estimate of carbon. Okay, so now uh, chlorophyll A, how do we measure chlorophyll A? Well, um, one way is with chlorophyll fluorescence. So we just established that chlorophyll A is an imperfect proxy for phytoplankton carbon. Chlorophyll fluorescence itself is a proxy for chlorophyll A. And it's imperfect because of species dependent and physiological variations in the chlorophyll specific uh, absorption coefficient. In other words, how the phytoplankton absorb light and other factors. So here's the only equation that you'll see in this whole presentation, and it's pretty simple. What we have on the left side is simply the fluorescence that we're going to measure is a product of one, two, three, four, five factors. And let's look at those factors. We're going to focus really in this presentation on only three of those factors. First is light. And in a chlorophyll fluorometer, we control the light. We're not depending on the sun here to measure the fluorescence. We're going to illuminate it. So we control that light. And that's good. So that is what E0 is. And the lambda with the EX means that's the excitation wavelength. In other words, the light that we use to excite chlorophyll fluorescence. And the other terms that are in this uh, product are the a chlorophyll specific absorption coefficient, which basically just means how much of that light per unit chlorophyll is uh, measured. And this is a standard measurement of ocean biologists who study phytoplankton absorption. Essentially take a whole bunch of different phytoplankton, use a spectrometer, measure the absorption coefficient. They've also measured total chlorophyll A and they scale it by chlorophyll A. And that leads to the third term, which gets rid of that denominator of chlorophyll A. So we then unscale it. And that's the quantity we're actually after, total chlorophyll A. 
The two other factors are ones that we have very little control over with a chlorophyll ferometer, and that's um, how, how many of those photons that come from our LED are turned into fluorescence. And that has, again, something to do with the species, something to do with physiology, but for the most part, we consider it constant. And then it just turns out that some of the light that is fluoresced is then reabsorbed. In other words, it never makes it to the, the chlorophyll fluorometers detector. That's a very small portion. And again, um, I recently saw a presentation how we might be able to get at that term, but it's fairly small. So for the moment, let's just consider that uh, as a factor of one, meaning that all the light that's emitted uh, in fluorescence we can detect, or it's a constant for which the calibration of the instrument uh, takes care of. So. Remember now, chlorophyll fluorescence, it's a molecular property. On the left, we see a chlorophyll molecule. And the important thing is that little green dot in the middle, that is a manganese atom. And as you know, metals like to conduct electricity and that is part of the role of chlorophyll is to take the energy from a photon, turn it into uh, what we wanna do, which is split water and create some, uh, uh, protons, some hydrogen atoms that drive photosynthesis, and as a byproduct of that, we release oxygen from the water. So with light on the right, this is the very simple schematic that you should try to remember with respect to how, what happens in a phytoplankton, uh, what happens with chlorophyll. Light is absorbed by chlorophyll and essentially on the right has one of three fates. It can either be used for photochemistry, and what we mean there is a precisely photosynthesis. It gets goes in, it gets splits water, it starts driving the Calvin cycle, which actually creates carbon or sugars. It can be dissipated as heat, just like you imagine when you're out in the sun, you feel it on your skin, your skin is getting warm. The other thing that can happen is fluorescence. And all three of these essentially, essentially add up to kind of a constant, meaning that for every photon that's absorbed, the, 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 the photon has to have one of these three fates. There's an obscure fourth fate that is really when bad things happen and it's when phytoplankton are stressed. A uh, certain kind of very reactive oxygen is created that is uh, detrimental to photosynthesis. And this usually means that the uh, phytoplankton is maxed out or dying. And so we'll leave that one for the moment. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, photosynthesis versus irradiance curves, this has to do with uh, when we're essentially saturated. So remember those three fates, photochemistry, heat, and fluorescence. What we're looking at here is again, actually another view of the phytoplankton or the chlorophyll molecule, but now we're looking at it in terms of energy states. And on the vertical axis, we see increasing energy states and the different horizontal lines are those energy states. And these are, this is essentially quantum physics to, to, to scare you a little bit. There are only certain allowable states in the organism that um, that that are, that are in the molecule that can be held based on the essentially molecules that make up that chlorophyll molecule or the atoms that make up that chlorophyll molecule. So in the blue lines, we see a photon being absorbed. So we're going up in energy. That's why the arrows are drawn up and that's where light is absorbed. And you see it going up to the state that's labeled C2. And you can follow the uh, purple squiggly line. And just as the previous little diagram showed, some of that can be dissipated as heat or, or some of it will be dissipated as heat. So it drops to a smaller level, but still what's called an excited level. In other words, we're above that ground state, which is at the very bottom of the picture. And then something still happens. Some of it is dissipated as uh, fluorescence. We can also, again, dissipate some of this as heat, as you can see in the purple squiggles way down at the bottom, where you have some fluorescence and a little bit of heat, or sometimes complete fluorescence and no heat, if you look at those four different red lines labeled fluorescence. Off to the right, you can see, if you turn your head sideways, this is essentially a phytoplankton absorption curve showing that phytoplankton absorb light at roughly two regions, somewhere around 400 and 450 nanometers and somewhere around 600 
nanometers. And you can see that those correspond to, first of all, the blue arrows, and that's why they're labeled blue for the BX, when we absorb some light, uh, blue light, and maybe some violet light, but to a lesser extent, any green or yellow or orange light. There's also another absorption peak uh, representing that S1 level. The point is, this is, how, this is how we get those different fates. They have to do with the molecular properties and it is related to the absorption curve. So let's go back to this equation. What we want to, or what we're going to measure is um, fluorescence. We can do that with a detector that measures fluorescence, which is always red around 695 nanometers. We can control the light and what we want is total chlorophyll A. So that's taking a look at the bottom right, there's one of our chlorophyll fluorometers. And what we see on the top is that in our new fluorometer, we can do the traditional um, chlorophyll uh, LED, which is blue and excite at 470, or we can excite at 435. And I'll get, explain why we're uh, adding this different excitation wavelength in a moment. But then we detect chlorophyll fluorescence for both of those at the same portion, because that's a molecular property. So we use exactly the same detector, no matter what excitation wavelength we use, which is around 695 nanometers. So let's talk a little bit about that second term, the chlorophyll specific absorption coefficient. And if you remember, I talked about in that uh, energy diagram that chlorophyll likes to, uh, has an absorption peak in the blue, but the sun isn't blue. The sun has a whole lot of colors and that's why it looks like it's yellow. It's got a whole lot of different things. So phytoplankton, just like trees and plants and everything else has a lot of different pigments. And depending on the species and usually based on its actual you know, adaptation, meaning I'm um, talking about now um, genetic adaptation, it has evolved, each phytoplankton species has evolved a, a complement of pigments, some of which depend on the lineage like red, brown, or green algae, which are some of the fundamental sort of, you wanna call them a royal, lines of royalty of, of, of uh, phytoplankton, but, they all have these what are called accessory pigments. And those accessory pigments do not drive photosynthesis directly themselves. They, if you wanna think about it, these are a set of trampolines of different colors. And imagine jumping up and down on those trampolines and your goal is to get to the reaction center, which is that uh, labeled in the center there. But you bounce around between the red and then the green and then the orange and maybe the yellow until you get to that reaction center. And the reaction center is definitely chlorophyll, which always absorbs in either the blue or the red. But those other pigments can absorb in different colors and essentially just transfer that. And it turns out the energy loss when you bounce from that trampoline to the next trampoline is very, very small, very, very, very small. So even though the photon may make many hops to get itself to the chlorophyll um, reaction center, it's almost um, lossless. That's not one of the places where we lose those, but these are the accessory pigments. We don't really want to measure those accessory pigments because they are variable with respect to the physiology, the species, how much light. The phytoplankton on the uh, scale of the order of seconds, minutes, and hours can change these pigments. So we really don't want to measure those. We really want to measure that chlorophyll A, which as we said, is an imperfect proxy for carbon. So how does that translate into how well we can measure chlorophyll. So what we're looking at in the upper right here, or, or I'm sorry, in the bottom uh, graphs is the best way that we can measure chlorophyll that not, not the accessory pigments with the chlorophyll using high performance liquid chromatography. We take water samples and use uh, uh, an expensive and um, uh, expensive machine that essentially takes the pigments, dissolves them in, in solvents and measures each one of the pigments. And what we're interested in is chlorophyll A and it turns out divinyl chlorophyll A, which is another um, a chlorophyll atom used by certain photosynthetic bacteria. 
And on the vertical axis, we have the chlorophyll that we've measured from fluorescence. So this is, think of chlorophyll from HPLC, this high performance liquid chromatography at the moment as our gold standard. And how well does our chlorophyll fluorometer match that? So these are essentially matchups. And you can see again, there's a fair amount of spread um, on the right is the total from 0.01 to 10 on both scales, and there's a fair amount of scatter, certainly less scatter than we saw on that carbon to chlorophyll ratio, but still a lot. And if we look in the upper right, if we look at that scale factor, in other words, what if we drew a line through that data, what would be the slope factor or, or the difference in slope between the chlorophyll from HPLC, our gold standard, and the, the, the chlorophyll from um, uh, from fluorescence, and that varies anywhere from one in the Arabian Sea upwelling all the way to over six in the Southern Ocean, the average being about two, and that's not so bad um, in that you could say, well, why are we a factor of two off? Well, we calibrated and originally calibrated our, our fluorometer. You have to pick something to calibrate with. We used a single species of phytoplankton because um, otherwise uh, the communities all over the ocean are different. So it's not so bad that the, the mean is a factor of two. What we're more concerned about is that spread that it's going from one to six. So if we had a mean of two, but the spread was only let's say one and a half to three and a half, we would have a more accurate measure of chlorophyll and hence a more accurate measure of phytoplankton. So this is all coming around to that's what we want to do. We want to chain, we want to zero in or reduce the variability of that slope factor between the gold standard chlorophyll from HPLC to fluorometry. So instead of one to six, we'd rather have something much smaller and how can we do that? So let's look at this. What we're seeing here is a graph of chlorophyll, um, I'm sorry, absorption, phytoplankton absorption of various pigments uh, versus wavelength. And look at the solid bars, the uh, solid lines, the solid green and the solid yellow. Those are the two chlorophyll pigments either in um, phytoplankton or in, in photosynthetic bacteria. And we'll note, you'll notice that um, their absorption peak, like I said before, is in the blue or in the purple, and it's on the downslope of those dotted lines, which are the accessory pigments that are, are, are used as trampolines. But what, those are quite variable. And so even though they're helping absorb photons, what we're really after is the green and the orange. So the uh, goal of our, uh, our current fluorometer uses the 470 nanometer uh, blue um, LED. And you can see that it intersects a lot of those dotted lines, which are quite variable. Whereas when we use a, a violet LED, 435 nanometers, it intersects more directly the um, green and yellow photosynthetic pigments that we want, meaning chlorophyll A and divinyl chlorophyll A. So it's as simple as that. We're just going to change the color of the LED from blue to violet. And what we're going to hope is since we're more directly exciting the chlorophyll pigments as opposed to the accessory pigments, that there will be less variability when we actually extract the chlorophyll pigments in HPLC between that and our, our chlorophyll ferrometry measurements. By the way, once we have two fluorometers and we always we either sell the 470 alone or 470 with 435, we never sell 435 alone because that doesn't allow you or us to maintain a global record. The global record is with respect to 470, but we can take the ratio of those two fluorescences and some work has already been done to look at what does that tell us? And we think just as a, you can imagine, that, that 470 excited the, the accessory pigments a little bit more. We think that 435 is more like biomass. You take the ratio and you have something that has to do with what we think is photoacclimation. In other words, how variable are those um, uh, accessory pigment uh, induced fluorescence scaled by something that's a little less variable. And we can see the results of that for a Noctiluca bloom in the Arabian Sea in 2011. You can see some variability with depth. So 
What's a better chlorophyll fluorometer? We think it's one that has uh, a 435 nanometer excitation. But just to prove this, as you noticed, we have to deploy this in the world's oceans. So this is a case where this is an experiment in progress with a released product. And we have a number of, um, of um, uh, partners, and it could be you, who help us with this global experiment. At the right, you can see some profiles that we've already done in the Mediterranean. What we're looking at are profiles of chlorophyll fluorescence from from three different fluorometers uh, with the blue dots is a uh, chlorophyll 470 with the orange dots is chlorophyll uh, excited by the 435 violet LED. And the uh, green dot is uh, another chlorophyll 470 fluorometer of, a, of an earlier design. And mostly just to make sure that we are definitely accurate with our 470 chlorophyll fluorescence. The black dots are those HPLC measurements. And again, they're from water samples, so they're at discrete locations. And this is a first order check. First of all, we can see that for these particular water, they're, they're lining up. In other words, there's no difference and they are matching the chlorophyll A. We haven't, I haven't shown the ratio of these here. Certainly this is not global data, this is one spot to start looking to see if that slope factor between our chlorophyll fluorescence and the total chlorophyll A across the world's oceans is different, we need global data. But this is just proving to you that yes, I can use a chlorophyll 435 nanometer um, excitation to measure chlorophyll just as accurately as I can of course uh, the blue LED excitation. And this is available today in our uh, eco line where you would have, for example, uh, chlorophyll 470 and backscattering at 700 nanometers, and then a second pair, which would have the chlorophyll 435 nanometer excitation, both with exactly the same detectors. Because again, that's a molecular property of chlorophyll that it fluoresces in the red. So chlorophyll 435 is available today in the eco line. It's deployed in the oceans already on Argo floats and increasingly so. 435 is always paired with a legacy chlorophyll 470 uh, blue LED to maintain the global data record. Global 435 data is needed to determine if the variability of uh, HPLC, total chlorophyll A, our gold standard versus chlorophyll fluorescence, if that slope variability and that slope factor can be reduced. And we also showed that it's possible that there's information about phytoplankton photoacclimation that may be present in the 470 and 435 ratio. And it's available now, and it's available as what we call the eco triplet FLBBFL. And that, think about it, is the first FL is the chlorophyll 470, the second is the backscattering 700, and the third is the chlorophyll 435. So there we are. Now on to questions. I would be happy to talk about this. You can imagine that I can go on and on about this, uh, but I'm happy to um, do this. Unfortunately, my chat is not showing the attendees, so I'm going to rely on my um, colleague, Nicole Lucas, to forward the questions to me. It doesn't look like we have any questions yet, but if any attendees would like to type their questions in the Q&A, then I'm sure. All right, Eric. there we go. The Q&A, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the chat. I've got the Q&A window open, uh, I don't, and I don't see any questions either in the Q&A or the chat. Oh, here we go. David is asking, will you be offering an eco quadruplet? We want a CHLA, CDOM, and backscatter. Can we get a core A with both excitations and the other two? You asked the, the $64,000 question, which is uh, a great question. And the answer is definitively yes. In our next generation of eco sensors, we will allow up to three pair of measurements. The first pair will allow us to do two measurements. 
the chlorophyll 470 and backscattering at 700, and they will share a pair because they share a common detector. So that's slot one. So that's two measurements. In the middle pair, you can imagine the chlorophyll 435 and a second uh, 695 uh, nanometer detector. And in third, you can put whatever you want, but yes, CDOM, you could put the uh, CDOM excitation emission pair. So that's four total, or one could imagine a dual pair, um, as I said before, without, without the seat on. But yes, we will have that opportunity in our next generation of equipment. We will, we, uh, of eco, and that eco will be available in all the various form factors, not all of them available with the three pair, but most of them. Uh, do, uh, I can see the questions now, I'll field them. Do fluorometer sensors drift in storage like other optical sensors? Um, that's a really good question. And the answer is not much, but that just like any other instrument, uh, fluorometer should be regularly calibrated. And that's, we spend a lot of effort getting what we call the metrology, the traceability of our measurements to something so that you can guarantee that a fluorometer that was purchased you know, 20 years ago matches that of one that you purchased today, but that requires calibration. One thing that you can do, there's two uh, things that are, are part of the calibration. One is called the dark counts. And one of the things that you can do is just simply tape over the sensor, uh, all both the, the, the LED and detector windows, uh, put it at a constant temperature. It doesn't have to be in water, but you can put it in water if you want. And just measure what are called the dark counts. And that's one of the parameters in the calibration equation. So when you take the digital counts, the first thing you do is subtract off the dark counts. And those represent essentially the photon noise in our silicon photo detectors. And that probably is the thing that can change um, more than anything, even the scale factor. And in fact, what Argo floats do is when they're down at one or 2,000 meters, there's virtually no light. They can do a dark count measurement without obviously needing to be taped over. So that's one thing that you can do. Um, but your flometer should be regularly calibrated. Now, what some people do is do field calibrations. They will, let's say, deploy an Argo float. They will do a profile, and they will take water samples right near that float. With, and, and subsequently do the HPLC and they'll come up with their own fluor, fluorometer calibration that is probably different than ours because we um, use, a, a, again, ours is tied to a single phytoplankton species and uh, there's gonna be a whole community of them. So that part's up to you. Um, in general, over the life of, let's say four years, we don't, let's say of, a, of an Argo float, we don't expect the fluorometer to drift since it's kept in very uh, sort of constant temperature environments and they don't get knocked about and things like that. Can I talk more about the photo adaptation part? So photo adaptation is um, imagine that um, you're a phytoplankton deep in the water. You might want to create what are called photosynthetic accessory pigments. You might want to widen your array of antennas so that you capture more photons because there's very little light and you'll grow more accessory pigments, more trampolines to absorb light, widen your absorption spectrum. However, if you're near the surface, you might say, oh my gosh, I've got too much sun. I want to create some pigments that actually shunt. Um, as in other words, they're trampolines that don't uh, funnel me towards the uh, reaction centers. I really do want to dissipate that um, light as heat. And in fact, what we can see is on a, on a daily basis, even if I hold the phytoplankton constant, the fluorescence goes down in the middle of the day because there are different accessory pigments being added and they actually take more of the photons away. And that's a problem actually. And we deal with that in Argo floats by, 
by making adjustments to the daytime fluorescence so that it's properly account this what's called non-photochemical quenching is adjusted for. But the point is that that's a little bit about photo adaptation. On the plus side, we can add pigments to increase our ability to funnel photons to the reaction center to the chlorophyll uh, molecule. We can also do photo. Uh, um, photoprotective accessory pigments, which essentially keep photons away from those. And those are the different aspects. That's the short uh, version of photo adaptation. Have you observed biofouling on ecosensors? For sure, for sure. It's possible in uh, for biofilm to grow on anything. Believe me, we're doing an experiment uh, with that right now with respect to some of our other equipment. So, um, uh, for example, again, using the Argo float example, most of their time is spent drifting for 10 days at 1000 meters where there's very little biofouling and they don't spend very much time at the surface, only when they profiled and they are doing their iridium communication to send uh, data home through the satellite. Uh, so we don't experience much biofouling, but if I take that same sensor and put it in coastal water, um, it will become biofouled. It could be within hours, depending on the environment. Uh, there's a whole set of literature on biofouling that now I am unfortunately familiar with. Um, we do sell ecofluorometers with wipers. Um, um, you can also use copper plates that reduce the biofouling on the face of the instrument, but obviously the holes for the LED to shine out and for the detector to receive light can't have copper over them. So the best anti-biofallant that you can have is something that actually wipes the surface. And we have ecofluorometers that have those wipers either for one pair, two pair or three pair of, um, um, of uh, measurements. Um, Let's see, if you do your own field calibrations with chlorophyll A extractions at the lab, do you still need a 430 wavelength because calibration should account for pigment interference? No, I mean, I would not say that the, the, the goal of the 435 wavelength is, should be put in the context of global measurements. What we'd like in our global, think about a global climate model that's assimilating chlorophyll A measurements from Argo floats, but it's also from ocean color satellites, which you are also tuned up to total chlorophyll A. We would like that total chlorophyll A uh, as a proxy for carbon to be as representative as possible. So those are, that's the motivation for deploying that. If, um, um, let's say you're just doing a regional experiment, you don't care about the rest of the world, right? You, and you, you can tune up your chlorophyll ferrometer to, with HPLC measurements, and you stay within your phytoplankton community and your um, relationship between the total chlorophyll A from HPLC and your chlorophyll from ferrometry, 470 is going to do just fine. You don't need a 430 wavelength. I think it's when you put it into the global context. So you're deploying these fluorometers in lots of different conditions. And sometimes in some places of the world, even in one spot, the phytoplankton communities are really, really different. So when you do that tuning up, you have you could even see, see your own scale factor change over time. So um, I would say to the extent that um, you have a, com a phytoplankton community that stays relatively stable in terms of its composition or its compositions. Um, you can live with just a 470 fluorometer. If you were doing global work, that's when I would recommend the 430. Or if for some reason you had a lot of variability in the phytoplankton communities, either on a seasonal basis or perhaps with climate change. That's the big question, right? How do you account for NPQ and BioArgo? Uh, I do want to direct you to there is um, literature available on the Argo BioArgo website that discusses this in detail. Um, one way is to use another proxy for carbon, which is backscattering. 
And what um, you can do is go down to a certain depth in the mixed layer and measure the backscattering to chlorophyll ratio. If you're in a mixed layer, just like when you mix your coffee, it becomes a constant color. Um, if you believe that your mixed layer is fully mixed and you go to the top of that layer, the backscattering should be roughly the same. And so um, you can apply the backscattering to chlorophyll ratio that you had below up above. Um, that is one measurement way to do it. Another is to use chlorophyll derived from irradiance. Many bioargo floats use um, have a radiometers. Um, if you're familiar with the work of Andre Morel and other folks at the uh, Laboratoire Oceanographique de Villefranche, they have um, done over the last 20 years quite a few empirical studies of the relationship of the diffuse attenuation coefficient, particularly at 480 or 490 nanometers in chlorophyll, and you can use that relationship. I'm happy to uh, point you to that literature, just send me an email um, and I can put uh, that into chat and we can, I can orient you to that literature. But the first place to start is with the Arg Argo documents, the Bio Argo documents themselves. But yes, it can be done and it is regularly done. Is the ECO FLNT you made in 2018, is the backscattering 700 be used in any way for chlorophyll A estimation? Well, um, the answer is yes, uh, in the manner that I just mentioned that um, if you were doing profiles and you had a mixed layer, you could go use that profile, uh, check to see if the mix, what the mixed layer depth is, look at that chlorophyll A to backscattering ratio and use it to back out that non-photochemical quenching, that depression in fluorescence during the day that has nothing to do with the change in uh, chlorophyll, it just has to do with the change in photo acclimation. So that's how you could use the two together. Again, I would orient you to the literature, both on the Argo side, even though your application may not be an Argo float, but you can learn about it a little bit from there. There's also a paper by Brandon Sackman from around 2004 to 2006 that covers this in detail. His uh, platform was actually Sea Glider. Again, happy to share my... Um, uh, email address if you need to be pointed toward that literature. Um, I think that handles all of the open questions. Um, Looks like uh, we have a participant with their hand raised, so I can go ahead and take him off mute if you'd like to ask a question. Sure, let's go for it. Thank you for considering being live. Uh, you're still on mute, Bruno. Hi, Bruno, you're still showing on mute. If you're having a problem with audio, don't hesitate to use the Q&A or even chat if that's what works for you. Okay, while we're waiting for Bruno, I'll take this other one from Anna. Have you compared sensors to some other chlorophyll methods such as fluorometric? Some of us don't have access to HPLC. Very good question. It is possible to take water samples and filter them onto filter pads and then um, using a, um, essentially a standard method. It's defined as an EPA standard method. That's what we use when we do it. Um, the variability in that measurement is more than that in total chlorophyll A, but yes, you can use that as a way to compare or possibly calibrate your fluorometer. Again, I would tend to say that that works if you are doing, let's say, a regional or a process study. 
uh, again, the gold standard is HPLC. Um, if you're really careful in your technique and um, 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 essentially if you can make sure that your protocol, and I know that there's a couple different tweaks to the fluorometric um, uh, approach, um, but as long as you're consistent, that's the most important thing. Yes, you can do that. I think what you'll do is when you see those matchups, like I showed in that last graph, where the black dots were right on top of the fluorometer traces, um, I think what you'll tend to see is a little bit more variability than you will with total chlorophyll A. Um, but um, the answer is yes, you can take that approach as long as you understand that essentially think of the error bars and each one of those things will just be a little bit larger than they would be with HPLC. What is my email? Um, I will, let's see, I will type an answer here. And anybody else who would like my email, feel free to stick a question in the Q&A and I will respond to it with my email. And Bruno, we are allowing you to talk, but um, we haven't heard you yet. Again, I encourage you to uh, use the Q&A if for some reason you can't unmute yourself. I hope you've all found this um, useful. Again, it's quite a tour to go from carbon cycle to um, a fluorometric equation, to a Jablonski energy diagram, to essentially when it comes down to it, changing the color and we put a little filter over it just to make sure if there's any variability in the LED and it gives us a sharper cutoff right near that um, change in the chlorophyll um, A absorption. But we are essentially changing an LED and a filter. And <laughs> frankly, that's all we've done to create that new channel. Um, but the impact can be large in terms of uh, trying to get a better, uh, handle on how carbon is used by global carbon models, global climate models. And um, as you know, that is one of the successes over the last 10, 20 years of climate modeling is the uncertainty in our understanding of these models being able to both predict the past, which is a measure of how good those climate models are, which gives us more confidence that they can predict the future based on different uh, fossil fuel emission scenarios. Um, that's really important to understanding and driving policy changes for the future. So um, it's amazing that small things like sensors can make a big difference in potentially policy decisions. So don't underestimate your uh, potential to contribute to these kinds of uh, understandings of the ocean and have influence on um, uh, hopefully a better understanding of the changes we need to make to um, uh, reduce climate change. The expect, uh, here's one from Francisco. Um, the expected peak of divinyl chlorophyll A is between the two excitation wavelengths. How do you compensate measuring on the downslope? Well, if, basically we don't. Um, remember, I'm just gonna go back to this um, uh, chlorophyll specific. You know, we're, we're doing the best that we can. We don't obviously have to hit the peak absorption for it to absorb. Um, I think we're doing better um, on average for divinyl chlorophyll A um, in that we're not on the downslope, we're in the broader part of the absorption spectrum. Um, the divinyl chlorophyll A 
is the photosynthetic pigment, meaning where the, 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 the molecule with the reaction center is just slightly different configured than chlorophyll A. And it is in Prochlorococcus, which is a photosynthetic bacteria. It's the most numerous bacteria photosynthetic organism on the planet. I think I learned somewhere that if you took all the Plocorococcus um, uh, bacteria and just stack them up, they would stretch across the galaxy or something like that. So um, it, it's an important <clears throat> pigment. <clears throat> and I think we are doing better even with not being perfectly aligned. You know, these choices are always um, a trade off. I think for me, the important point was to stay away from the peaks in the either the photosynthetic accessory pigments like fucoxanthin and the 19, uh, uh, the, the 19 prime ones listed there, and the photosynthetic photoprotective pigments like zeaxanthin. So um, we essentially wanted to stay away from those physiologically and light history variable uh, pigments. Not a perfect science, uh, but this is um, sort of the best that we can do. Remember, these are, these are all essentially fixed things. By the way, I just wanted to mention that these chlorophyll, these uh, chlorophyll and photosynthetic absorption curves are from a paper by Annick Bucot in 2004, directly from that paper. These are the, the pigments in, uh, in vivo, meaning in water. These are not uh, in a solvent. The point about that is in solvents that all these peaks shift a little bit. So I just wanted to reassure you that these are the absorption peaks that you will see in the water not in solvents. Not a question uh, from Taylor, not a question. I'd be interested to get your email if you're looking for potential test users. Yes, I am. One of the things I'm particularly looking for is anybody who might be going to 6,000 meters or greater than 5,000 meters depth. That's something that we're having real problem finding. But I will um, provide Taylor uh, my email address to you, and you can contact me offline if you'd like to beta test one of these in our new um, configuration. Let's see, Taylor, I, uh, if I clicked on the wrong button, feel free to ask a question again. I did send you my email. Just so everyone knows too, there will be an email going out from Zoom after the session that includes my email. So if you have any questions, you can also respond via that way and I'll forward them on to Eric. Okay, Taylor got it, good. Um, Nicole, this session goes till nine, is that correct? Correct. So um, we do have a little time if you have any other questions. Don't be shy, this is your time. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our presentation today. Um, it's been my goal to, um, as a scientist, to do what we can to innovate with respect to the science of how we make our measurements. And some of that has to do with the traceability of our measurements, assuring to you that when you get a calibrated product, that um, if we were to pick any sensor off our uh, production line and calibrate it, you would get the same answer when you stick it in your water. And that, that the, the uh, traceability of that measurement is well understood. And we uh, pay a lot of attention to that uh, traceability and we're uh, constantly improving those processes. But as importantly, we're also looking at like with the 435 new measurements that allow us to understand the world's oceans better. And uh, uh, sometimes we're doing innovation to simply just reduce the cost either of our equipment or of its maintenance. So for example, we have a hyperspectral absorption and attenuation meter. 
that used to have an incandescent lamp, we've uh, replaced that with a white LED that gets about 10,000 hours of lifetime as opposed to less than 4,000. So that means less trips back to the office or back to service with that. And it turns out that's got a little bit better signal to noise ratio in the blue. Just a little bit more oomph in that blue, uh, in the blue in the uh, white light LED, which means our absorption measurements, the error bars on our absorption and attenuation measurements in the blue are smaller than they used to be. So um, whether it's you know the particular design of our instruments, the configuration of them with respect to the measurements, or um, the calibration of those instruments, we're constantly um, trying to improve all of those. Um, Andrea, I, it's possible to, um, I, I guess that would be a question for Nicole, is it possible to have a recording of the presentation? Yes, this whole presentation is being recorded, um, and I believe it will be put up on our YouTube channel. It may take a week or so, um, but a recording will be going up. And Andrea, I'm going to send you my email, and what uh, if you want, you can we can schedule a special time after you've watched that to go over uh, any questions that you have. So just send me an email and we'll find a time so that you can have to, to, to not walk away with, God, I really didn't get that and uh, I missed my opportunity. So um, you can have, um, we, we'll, we'll make some time for you. I'm a little hesitant to, I think, um, um, publish my email on YouTube just for spam's sake. But as Nicole pointed out, you all will have an email address. Um, we'll see what we can do with respect to when this gets published. Is, is it on YouTube, Nicole? Yes, I think that is the plan. We'll, we'll find a way that you will have a contact that can get to me. Yeah, all of you will be getting an email, um, a fo like follow-up email after this session that does include my email. So. Um, you can you can send any questions and it that way and it also will have a link to our YouTube channel which has various other videos as well so um, if you have any questions you can respond by that yeah and we'll, we'll keep an eye out to comments on this video as another forum for for um, chat Well, all right, we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much for spending an hour with Seabird today to learn about the uh, dual um, 435, 470 nanometer fluorometer. I hope that um, you have uh, gained an appreciation for how and the motivation for that and how you can contribute to a better understanding of the world's oceans and um, that you have appreciation for um, how seriously we take um, your needs as a customer for innovation. Uh, again, feel free to contact us with your ideas and uh, share the video with your friends if you found this useful to yourself.